Okay, um, thank you so much everyone for joining. And um, I'm super excited to have you all here today. Um, my name is Paul Chikuma and I'm from the Lost and Damaged Coalition. And um, I am um, kind of whole leading the session um, with me is um, Adeline um, from the Lost and Damaged Coalition, if you can say hi. All right. Um, thank you so much. I'm um, so sorry. I'm um, sorry for the delay. Um, most of the most of the um colleagues of the session, they are they kind of finding it difficult to join. Um, so that's why we we were kind of waiting to see if they can join. But I guess we have to to move forward. Um, with the presentations that we have. Um, yeah. So um, basically the the yes and also um mamadou um from the loss and damages coalition who is the advocacy co-coordinator um if you can say hi um yes okay cool um all right um, so basically the conversation um of course generally the cba 16 is around lla um, but um, the conversation in this um, particular session would um, actually project into um, loss and damage. Um, so um, before we kind of um, delve into the conversation proper, I would uh, um, I would kind of um, do a brief presentation on um, on loss and damage. Um, from the coalition's perspective. Um, yes, so um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so um, first welcome um, everyone who's in this call today. And I hope you would um, enjoy um, this brief presentation on, on loss and damage itself. So um, first of all, the whole conversation projects from climate change itself. Um, um, of course, we know that um, the, the 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 average temperature before pre-industrial levels there has been an increase in temperature, and currently at one point one degrees Celsius, but it's also increasing to one point two, and um, and of course, um, this climate change event um leads to um leads to these consequences or impacts that we frame with the um with the phrase called loss and damage um so basically loss and damage itself refers to the consequences of the um climate change events that's not avoided through mitigation and adaptation um it's really important for us to frame this um properly of course we know that like there is still no consensual or totally agreed definition of the term loss and damage within the UNFCCC, but um, generally we have like an understanding of what the of what the term really means, and um, and and in practice this means that when um climate change events like um, um climate change events like um like flooding occurs, um in communities where there there is um there is little capacity to respond these losses and damages actually occur so probably be, um, bridges are broken roads are damaged um lives are lost so those impacts from that climate change events that's what we frame with the term loss and damage um so we can clearly see that there is losses and there's also damages so um when the the, the negative impacts of this climate change um, can either be replaceable or irreplaceable. So when it's irreplaceable, we call it um, losses. For example, if someone dies as a result of flooding in a particular community, um, you can't replace that life, right? But um, if a bridge is broken, then um, that can be replaced. So that's a damage. So um, we, there's like a, there's a need to really clarify what the loss and also what damage is. But of course, um, losses and damages can be economic and, and non-economic. Um, so, um, um, so 
in general terms within the the ESCOM um, document around loss and damage training, it's clearly outlined that um, when these losses and damages have to do with resources, goods, and services um, that are traded I mean, the market, for example, that they, that's what um, we refer to as economic, um, economic losses and damages. But all other losses and damages that do not fit into this categorization are referred to as non-economic losses and damages. So, um, these losses and damages are actually caused by climate change events, right? But these events can either be slow onset um, events or extreme events. So these extreme events are those that happen over a long period of time and uh, um, over a short period of time, while the slow onset events occur over a long period of time. For example, sea level rise, um, ocean acidification, those occur over a very long period of time. But the flooding, the cyclones, um, they usually have short time frames. So, um, like I mentioned earlier, the cyclones, the wildfires, the floods, they're uh, immediate. Um, they usually come about. Um, they're usually associated with a short time frame, and um, but for the slow onset events, it's usually over a long period of time. So um, here is like an example of what loss and damage looks like on the ground. As you can see, um, these are like people in the native community that have been affected by, um, by this climate change event. Um, on one end, we can see that there was like um, this um, um, flood, um, there was like an, an ongoing flood, and um, that resulted to damages of this property. Of course, there could be losses here as well, because um, people might also have lost their life as a result of the as a result of the flood. And there are numerous other examples. Of course, um, the most outstanding, um, the, the most recent happenings as well, the flooding in Pakistan and the rest of that, these are like examples of, um, these are like examples of climate change events that have resulted to really um, immense um, losses and damages. Um, so because it's really important, um, there is like a need for us to really look at the justice perspective and also the finance um, aspect of, um, of, um, of loss and damage. And, and, um, and basically, when we say loss and damages, it's usually responses to, um, the responses to events that has happened. So of course, um, the, for a community that actually, um, um, had lost, let's say, the crops that should have served as food, then relief materials can actually go into those communities to help them, to help them recover um, from that particular um, from that particular event in the community. So apparently, we as youths um, and also um, the the residents in the global south, we we perceive this as um, very the biggest um, climate injustice um, issue um, we've, we've, we've actually, we're currently experiencing. And, and that's because little contribution um, being the most, we are actually still being the most um, impact of these happenings. And there is like this deliberate um, rejection or opposition whenever the, the discussions around loss and damage is raised. Um, yeah, in, in in contextualizing this, um, um, loss and damages, especially the economic dimension of it, can actually be reflected in numerical figures, and um, we can we can see that as a twenty twenty estimated losses and damages was actually between one zero zero and four hundred um, billion dollars, and by twenty fifty this would actually move to um, between one to one to one to two trillion trillion dollars. Um, however, um, we we still shouldn't um, be we still recognize the fact that there is very little action around loss and damage in terms of its finance. Um, but of course, the argument is it's not really substantial enough to respond to the need on the ground. Um, so there is um, support from the Scottish government and also philanthropies have committed um, to it as well. Of course, um, the, 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 there are questions around um, should the finance for loss and damage should, um, be humanitarian or 
it should actually um it actually has it just because like if it's um if we're actually depending on donors or people who give out of goodwill um then uh, in a way there's like a denial that there's a just ground for the demand for less and damage finance of course those are like conversations that we have to really reflect on um the support like the kind of support is really important um that's why um for example some of the suggestions around loss and damage finance um structural mechanism um from organizations like um oxfam and iied um would actually talk around around the lines of um uh, making sure that the finance for loss and damage is actually additional it is um immediate um like we were able to assess these funds once it's um once there's an incident of loss and damage so the, the, these are like questions we still have around the current support and and of course um we're still aware that the um denmark has actually committed around 13 million dollars as well to support developing countries along the lines of um of loss and damage um so from the developing countries perspective um especially this is really clarified within the discussions of the unfgpc and um and i think at COP26, there was like this clear demand from China and the G and G77 countries that there should be a loss and damage finance facility, but um, this was substituted for the um, this was substituted for the um, Glasgow dialogue, which should actually run for a period of three years and should be a platform for relevant stakeholders to actually discourse on the financing required to support actions that address loss and damage on the ground. Um, but Clearly, the opposition at COP26 um, showed a bit of resistance. Um, um, in a way, um, there's, there was like a pushback for the, the, the finance um, facility. Um, and that the resolution was like the, the climate dialogue. And of course, um, in um, looking at the demand from, developing, from the developed countries to the developing countries, you can see um that from the developed countries perspective it's as though um the discussions around loss and damage financing adds additional burden to um to the actions around climate um to the to to the actions they are taking around responding to climate change um but from the developing countries perspective it's a just demand reflecting on historic um co2 emissions and that kind of um, justifies the demand um, as well. So um, we can we can actually say that the two countries, um, two two groups of countries, actually have different stance on this. And um, on one end, it's it's a just demand, but on the other end, it's um, it's an additional um, burden, or um, you know, it's an additional burden to the course of actions they're already taking uh, uh, along the lines of um, climate action. Um, so basically, um, moving on to COP27 and beyond, of course, like um, one of the key metrics we were looking at uh, before the end of COP27 is uh, the operationalization of the central network on this damage course. Um, even though we are demanding for the finances, we still need um, this clear technical support to facilitate the development of the frameworks that should um, kind of um, help administer structured actions on loss and damage in local communities. So um, generally, the Santiago network should be that um, should be the source of technical support, um, especially to developing countries to address loss and damage in the local communities. And so um, at COP27, that's one um, that's one key metrics we are actually looking at. And um, having highlighted earlier responses to loss and damage um, occurrence in local communities require finance um, because apparently most of these vulnerable communities would not have the capacity to respond to the impact of climate change on their livelihoods or their ways of life or their ancestral heritage and of course that's where the the need for finance coming so they're able to kind of respond effectively and gain back their lives and also um, go back to how they were before the event actually happened. So these are like two these are like two metrics we're, we're looking at. Um, 
moving forward. Of course, I already said that um, although the the Glasgow um, the Glasgow dialogue was was actually raised up at the COP twenty six, it's still um, it's still not clear on what the governance structure um, would look like. Um, and of course, it's still like subject to to debate on um, in terms of putting together the support. How would it really work in practice? What's the structure and mechanism that facilitates the flow of the financial support from developing from developed countries to developing countries? And so that's why uh, moving to COP27, we would really expect to have an, um, advances around loss and um, loss and damage finance, and also the center going to talk on loss and damage. Um. So basically, um. We we as you to um first of all loss and damage itself as a word it's still not properly understood by a lot of people and um so but we still we still think um action should be taken and um with the little knowledge and understanding we have around the context looking at the severity of the impact it's having on our local communities we still think um we should take the little actions cause loss and damage is happening now it's taking lives now. It's this. Um, it's kind of affecting livelihoods and also um, a risk to the future of youths. Um, now, um, yeah. From the perspective of the loss and damages coalition, we would um, we kind of put forward a summarized version of what um, what like the youth because like it's a coalition of um, youth from all over the world, and the demand we put across is like a reflection of the realities that youth face on the ground, right? Um, so. Youth inclusion decision making process is a very important priority because, um, first of all, we are the ones on the ground. We are the ones who would um be here for a very long time. Would be here right after most of these leaders are gone, and would be bearing more of these consequences. So our perspective is actually needed, um, and we should be included in the whole decision making process. So it incorporates the youth perspectives as um much as possible. And of course, the coalition is so much open to meeting with um, relevant stakeholders. For example, we're able to meet with the um, we're able to meet with the um, COP27 presidency team to really put across um, the perspective of youths around um, the subject matter of loss and damage. Um, yes, so basically, that uh, that's a brief um, summary of um, loss and damage, and. Um, and the next thing would be to, to to kind of do a quick review. Like right now, if you have questions, you can literally ask the questions while we um, do a little bit of a fun activity. Um, so we're gonna have this metameter, with which we would gauge um, our understanding derived based on the presentation. And, um, but of course, feel free to, Use the chat box if you have a question or um, if you do have a question while um, I kind of put up the metameter so we kind of evaluate our understanding based on the presentation. So thank you so much for listening. Okay, um, so I guess I'm so much of a good presenter um, that I have no questions and I communicated effectively. Thank you so much. I feel proud of myself. All right, so. Um, hey, 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 I have, I have a question for you. Yes, yes. Hello, Paul. Yes, yes, I'm here. I can hear you. Paul, thank you very much. That was very good uh, uh, primer for us to understand what is loss and uh, uh, damage. And my question is, uh, on climate uh, change and disasters, uh, the developing countries do earmark funds, enormous funds. Let me take a classical example of USA. 
during pandemic, they announced $80 billion in one of the webinar I was present. And later COP26, you must be knowing, again, hundreds of billions of dollars. But there is one uh, suspicion that the developing countries announce these uh, financial uh, implications to benefit their infrastructure. What is your comment on this? Um, okay, so maybe I will start with the question on uh, loss, um, loss and damage, how can we link to insurance system? Um, so from the, the little understanding on um, insurance linked to loss and damage, it's um, like traditionally, that's one of the response mechanisms to loss and damage that's a bit adopted or accepted within the UNHCRC. So how insurance work is there's like a premium fee and of course, when these losses and damages occur, then um, whosoever the premium was paid to, then they kind of take responsibility for the losses and damages. Um, but of course, from that very simple explanation, this doesn't really fit into the context of the vulnerable communities because these communities themselves cannot afford to pay, the, pay those premium with which they can be able to get the financial, like the response when these loss and damages occur. So. In my head, I, I think the insurance, um, first of all, is like a mechanism that, that's a bit accepted, um, especially within the discussions around loss and damage, but um, a thorough analysis of its impacts or um, how it fits into um, the, the discussions, because like we, we are raising loss and damage finance, because the people most affected are the vulnerable communities with less capacity. So how would you explain that solution fitting into those people that originally do not have these capacities to pay those premiums or those large um, sums of money to kind of have the support when they experience loss and damage? So um, in summary, yes, it's a system we know, and also within the UNFCCC, it's something that... Um, in a way, it's one of the mechanisms that we know there, but it just doesn't address the issue that we are raising as youth around the discussions on loss and damage. And of course- Excuse me, um, I, I have a supplementary uh, query on that. Okay. See, in 1992, UNSAID, Earth Summit, there was a proposal to bring in a concept, polluter pace, polluter pace. See, now, now COP26, the scientific evidences show that there is a correlation between the polluter and the damage. And people are losing their habitat for no fault of their, they're losing their livelihood. Their life is endangered. Is it too early at this stage that we seek that polluter pace principle is revoked again? Um, actually, within the UNFCCC, there, there are principles that guide conversations, and one of them is the polytope principle. Of course, we have things like um, the precautionary principle as well. So it's actually there on paper. We know this is actually what's, what's needed for us to move forward. The issue is then implementation. So just to tie this up quickly with what you said originally, there are commitments, right? Um, so for example, there's like a hundred billion um, dollar goal after 2020 annually from developing country, from the developed countries to developed countries. But the truth of the matter is there is no, to the best of my knowledge, there is no single year where that target was met. So it is like, it's in a way, it's something that we experience or it's happening right before us where commitments are made and they are not um, what's it called? Um, they're not really. They're not really. Um, those who make this commitment do not really implement what. So, they so have basically, it's an issue here. of compliance. That's what yeah. it's called. It's basically, an issue of compliance. Yeah, in a way, right? Um, okay. So I think I think around uh, around these discussions, that's why you see from the switch from the Kyoto Protocol where they were like binding limits, um, we are now kind of within the Paris Agreement, it's not like this voluntary kind of commitment from countries. So what can you do as a country? Of course, these are like discussions around the Article 6, making it more voluntary rather than sending binding limits. So we have more kind of words translating to actions. So that's like what it looks like within the frame of the UNFCCC. Thank you. 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 Th
Um, and thank you so much um, for your questions. Um, thank you, Rich, because you, 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 you found that nobody's putting questions. I thought of filling the gap. <laughs> yeah, so that, thank uh, you so, so yeah, much. The response is also quite good. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, yeah. So um, before we move to the next session, I will be handing over to Adeline. Um, but before we do that, I just put the link to a metameter. Um, this is just like to, to help us kind of rewind. Um, that was like a very boring, I just gave a very boring and lengthy conversation um, presentation. So let's just rewind a little bit and have a little bit of fun before we transit to the storytelling session. So um, just click on the link, the Metimeter link, and kind of um, respond to the questions. Um, I, urge, I urge everyone to kind of respond because that's what is going to make the session fun. Because um, I'll, be, I'll be presenting the responses to the question and we'll be seeing what everyone is saying. Um, yes. Okay. All right, so let me don't keep the results to myself while you're putting it in. Um, let me give you some visuals as well. I'm not presenting it correctly, but yeah. So yeah, this is what it looks like. Okay, there is Senegal, there is India, there is UK, there is Rwanda, China Dad. Oh, we are actually 17 or 19 on the call. And we have just uh, five responses. Um, can we keep it coming? Um, we have five minutes for this activity. Okay, I'm not sure um, that that um, that activity was as fun as it was meant to be. Um, but thanks everyone who kind of tried to participate. Um, yes. So I would uh, I would pass the mic to Adeline, who will take us through the storytelling um 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 section. Thank you so much for listening. 
Um, thank you, Paul, for the great presentation. Um, hello, everyone. Um, as Paul said, I'm going to take you guys through um, our storytelling part of LDYC. So uh, basically, um, uh, we, in LDYC, we collect stories around climate change because we believe stories um, touches um, the heart um, and incite uh, people to take action more than researchers or, or people um, can do. So um, the first, I'm going to show you some videos and we'll have um, one storyteller sharing um, his personal story. And the first video, um, I think, um, goes well with, uh, with Jagannath and uh, Paul's um, discussion um, regarding um, uh, who should pay for loss and damage. The present is already catastrophic. The present is already scary. If we fail to address loss and damage, the future will be much worse. This is loss and damage. It's what happens when climate change intensified disasters like hurricanes, wildfires and floods, and slow moving catastrophes like droughts and sea level rise lead to a loss of life culture, biodiversity, territory, and livelihoods, as well as damage to homes, hospitals, schools, and roads, which often forces people to flee their homes. Loss and damage as of 2022 is taking place in every single country in the world, including rich countries, but the impacts are mostly on poor people in the poor countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. If your island is going underwater, you have to move. If your farmland is turning into desert, you have to leave. If forest fires are destroying your home, what choice do you have? In 2020, we saw heavy rainfall causing four rivers to burst their banks in the western part of Uganda, causing massive destruction and leaving over 100,000 people displaced. In the global negotiations on climate change, in the Paris Agreement in 2015, Article 8 was agreed to tackle loss and damage. But since then, not a single penny has been made available for the victims of loss and damage from climate change. And this is a problem because areas prone to loss and damage are no longer insurable. Insurance is something that works on probability. When you know that you are definitely going to be impacted by climate change, insurance doesn't work. Therefore, money for people to put their lives back together needs to come from somewhere else. Those who are at the front lines are the least responsible for the climate crisis. I do believe in the polluter pays principle. Fossil fuel companies and the biggest polluting countries have the responsibility to provide compensation for loss and damage. The major fossil fuel companies around the world have known for decades that they were producing a polluting product and they have suppressed that information and they prevented action. As a result, they've made billions of dollars of profit. Therefore, they are completely liable to be challenged now to pay up for the loss and damage that they have knowingly caused amongst poor people in poor countries in particular. Although there is clearly a pressing need to support communities impacted by loss and damage, finance has been blocked, denied, and deemed too expensive by those who have polluted. The Global North hasn't done anything about loss and damage because it has refused to accept responsibility for the climate crisis. They don't want to pay the bill. With similar compensation funds already in existence, it is high time to set one up for loss and damage. We do have an example of compensation for pollution. The major oil companies all have a fund that they put money into where if there's an oil spill, those who have been affected can claim compensation without having to prove which company caused the damage. And that's what we need for loss and damage from climate change. The present is already catastrophic. The present is already scary. And if compensation is not given, the future is going to be much worse. COP26 failed to deliver finance for loss and damage. We need to build momentum from Glasgow to COP27 to secure finance for loss and damage once and for all. 
From the perspective of vulnerable communities and vulnerable countries, COP26 failed to deliver finance for loss and damage. For the people at the front lines who need that money now, we expect COP27 to deliver it. COP27 will only be successful if a compensation fund is put in place for communities that are facing the impacts of the climate crisis right now. We have been waiting and waiting for the last 30 years and we cannot wait any longer. If we do not address loss and damage, then there is no climate justice. It's not just what loss and damage is, but what it means. It speaks of the existential threat that the heating of our fragile band of atmosphere represents. It's the signpost of what's to come. The alarm bell that tells us we are running out of road for ignoring it as if it isn't there. We are running out of road for doing nothing proportionate to the scale of the problem. We are running out of road. Taking care of those at the sharp end of this climate change that is happening now, not tomorrow, but now, is urgent and long overdue. Thank you, Paul. Um, as you have seen, this is a great video um, on loss and damage finance. It's a video that has been produced by Robin Hood Task through um, their Make Polluters Pay um, campaign. So the next video is a video produced by IED. It's an animation that shows how climate-related loss and damage is impacting people in Nepal. As you know, um, the um, last um, few days, Nepal have been affected um, by some flight. So um, please take a look at it. And I'm going to share the link to the first video in the chat. Thank you. I feel so proud to be from Nepal where people live in harmony with nature. But the climate crisis is hitting my beautiful homeland, pushing us beyond our ability to cope. The Himalayan glaciers are melting and feeding the lakes that burst and sweep away entire villages. Downstream communities can lose their lives and property in an instant. Persistent threat is terrifying. Our efforts to build stone walls to protect forest cover and villages can't hold back climate change. As in other least developed countries, most Nepali people depend on agriculture for their livelihood, which makes us extremely vulnerable to climate change, though we have done the least to cause it. My family used to farm, but no matter how hard we tried, we produced so little. It's getting warmer and new diseases are affecting crops. Like many others, we had to move to find new opportunities. Now I live in town, but here too, more intense monsoon rain causes destructive floods. Reduced harvest, puts pressure on men's role in our patriarchal society. Drought has forced women to travel longer distance for fire, wood and water, making them vulnerable to sexual exploitation. Many girls drop out of their school or are married off to cope with food scarcity. I'm afraid and sad that this changes the risk our society's stability. World leaders must recognize the loss and damage hitting the least developed countries and take increased action by providing finance and technical support. The vicious cycle of loss and damage we face due to climate change must end now. Thanks again Paul for the presentation of the video. Um, I believe, I really think this is a, the video is a great um, representation of uh, economical and non-economical loss and damage. And now I would like to welcome um, our storyteller, Aziz Abu Bakar, to share his personal story with loss and, loss and damage. Aziz, Aziz Abu Bakar is a climate activist from Nigeria. Aziz, are you able to speak? So welcome now. 
yes, I am able to speak right now. Um, good afternoon, good morning, and um, good evening, wherever you are. Um, are you able to hear me clearly? Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah, sure. No, don't care. All right, great. Okay, so um, my name is Aziz Abubakar, I'm from the interior. Just wanted to introduce myself again. Um, I'm a global shaper. Um, I used to be a global citizen fellow and I volunteer with the Lost and Damaged Youth Coalition. I also have um, initiated um, lots of um, climate adaptation project as a global shaper. Um, I've um, done a lot of engagements on the ground. And, um, I'm really passionate about climate change and that's because um, it has personally affected me. And that's why um, I'm so connected and I kind of recognize the urgency to act now. So I'm going to be sharing my story now on the loss and damage. Okay, so just give me a moment, sorry. All right, okay, so here it is. Six years ago, I was in a car with my brother trying to look through the car window, but it was so difficult to see what was going on outside due to the heavy rainfall. The rain was falling so heavily that for a moment, I thought it could actually damage the exterior of the car. I noticed that it wasn't just rainwater, but a mix of small sized solid ice. That very evening, we're stuck in traffic on the popular bridge in Lagos when the winds got strong. The rain was torrential and I couldn't help but feel like the water below was going to rise and flood the bridge, sweeping the cars and the terrified people into them off into the depths of the Atlantic Ocean. It was horrifying. The sound of fear and panic spread like wildfire, rushing through us as if, as we all awaited our fate, stranded somewhere in between safety and danger. Rain fell continuously for three hours, three very long hours. My brother and I were pretty fine, but imagining that the strength of the water below could actually collapse the bridge. Eventually, the rain stopped falling and cars started moving again, gradually awakening from the state of ill fitted unease. We got home thanks to that incident wasn't worse than it was. But then I thought, what if we all had been swept away into the ocean? I started researching what could have caused it. I discovered it was one of the climate change impacts. Not a lot of people have been lucky enough to survive such experience. Many people in my community, vulnerable people, who in some cases can barely put food on their table, people who have contributed the least to causing the climate crisis. These are the people that are the most affected. These are the people whose properties are damaged whose livelihoods are lost, caused not just by flooding, but also droughts and desertification. Yet, governments of developed countries who have historically polluted the environment to build their cities are ignoring the scale of the problem. They have done very little to help developing countries and least developed countries that suffer the most from climate-induced loss and damage. This is unfair. This is climate injustice. Due to this, I started advocating for adequate finance for climate-induced loss and damage now. I joined with millions of 
young people who are calling on world leaders of developed countries to support developing countries to adapt and build resilience against the climate crisis. So thank you all for listening to my story. Yeah, over to you, Adeline. Uh, thank you, um, Aziz, um, for sharing your story. Um, now I'll give back to Paul Chukuma. Right. Um, thank you so much. Um, yes. So the, the next thing we're supposed to, to do is to um, actually go into breakout rooms. Um, what we we are actually on time, like we wouldn't be able to complete that activity if we'd go into breakout rooms. Um, so probably I would open the floor at this point for one or two questions before we kind of end the section. Um, but I can see a hand up, um, Jagannatha, the floor yeah, is yours. Yeah, call me JV, very short. Uh, Paul and all, all uh... Uh, eco friends, I have one or two <clears throat> uh, points to raise here. Uh, there is a popular corporate joke, you know, agree in the conference, disagree in the toilet. It's a very popular uh, joke. In Paris, it was agreed, but not even a single penny came out. That's what uh, Professor uh, Huck said. No, I have one small, simple uh, suggestion to make. We are not touching upon an issue in the global economy. That is, the developing world wants to keep the inequality as it is and give here and there some compensation. That is not going to help. We are not able to, not able to, see it's like this, whether it's WHO or UN, what is the role? Simply a country can pass a veto and the, the human conscience is defeated. I think we have to make the civic societies and the human conscience to wake up. See, if Paris Convention and COP27, if nothing moves for loss and damage, what does it indicate? It simply indicates that the system is failing. We're all winning, but the system is failing. So I want to submit that. Let a resolution be made from this session that we need to search solutions with civic bodies and uh, people who stand by the human conscience, because I was very much convinced the insurance is not loss and damage issue, it's something else. It leads to pollution pace and some sort of a, uh, you know, um, um, compliance, compliance to already the damage is made. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to pronounce this wrongly again. Jagmata. Yes, um, amazing contribution. And then I really, really do appreciate um your your proactivity. I think we have one um question in the chat. Um we we will take that question and then um Ayn Kaz is asking as a climate justice issue. There has been calls for loss and damage as part of operation to developing countries, former colonies. Do you think this is a useful framing? Um, I think th this this question can be open to to everyone. Um, let me paste it in the chat again. I think this is our last um, a last activity for a last activity for the day or for this session. So um. Someone was asking, as a climate justice issue, there has been called for loss and damage um, to be a part of reparations to developing countries. Um, so, Jamie, Jamie Williams, you can speak. Thank you very much. Um, in answer to the question, it isn't a useful framing because it's like a red rag to the developed countries that's the absolute that they won't stand for so <clears throat> um, what the climate action network has done in its 
extremely effective advocacy for loss and damage in the UNFCCC has been to um, highlight the aspect of addressing loss and damage. So if colleagues um, replace uh, reparation with address, then it means that they'll have a channel of communications to the countries that are committed to funding uh, loss and damage through the Paris Agreement. I think it's really important for the colleagues on this call to recognise how much progress has been made um, in, in the aspect of, of setting up a framework for loss and damage. There are several uh, processes that are going forward within the UNFCCC, um, which uh, will will with a headwind lead to the establishment of a facility i think colleague was talking about uh, um was talking about um, implementing loss and damage and this is an absolute absolute necessity uh for that because it has to be done unilaterally uh, uh, multilaterally it has to be done through the united nations i really would i put into the chat um some of the uh, papers that argue cogently for loss and damage uh, finance facility, very technical idea, but it really, what's happened is that uh, adaptation and uh, and um, mitigation have funding facilities specifically. I mean, the biggest is the Green Climate Fund, but there are others, but there isn't a funding channel for dedicated for loss and damage. And one of the pressures that uh, climate action network has been putting and alongside least developed countries and other uh, developing countries within unfccc has been uh, including the g77 and china which is now led by pakistan it's going to be led by pakistan next month um they have put this uh finance facility as being uh as being the critical need because once that's established, it can be then then be filled in with the implementation aspects that colleagues have been talking about. I'll stop there. I've said enough. Thank you. Oh, amazing, amazing um, contribution, Jimmy Williams. Thank you so, so much. Um, does any other person have a contribution or addition to what Jenny has just said? Because I think um, from my perspective, that summarizes it. Um, very very well um but we have one or two minutes to to make any additions um any other person um no hands up okay um okay jimmy Sorry, Chikwana, to come back, but I really th appreciate this session. Um, this is something that at Islamic Relief Worldwide, we've been working intensively on adaptation, trying to highlight the needs for a, a, a more uh, concerted recognition of the adaptation issues within the UNFCCC and also within civil society generally. But Really, um, it's we've come to the point which I think our colleague Salim, Salim Al Haq, who who, who uh, appeared in in one of the videos, uh, has come to the adaptation. We're going past adaptation. Uh, we're getting to the point where, uh, as UNFC as uh, IPCC identified beyond adaptation, um, we've reached the limits of adaptation, and especially the uh, cataclysm in Pakistan was particularly resonant for our large team there. And I think that it really is important to make the links between uh, uh, adaptation and also between locally led adaptation and loss and damage because they are one thing runs into another and I think possibly CBA next year could uh, could look at um, that relationship and see possibly the place for locally led responses to loss and damage so assuming the funding comes through and it is in the form of uh, grants not loans one of the big contentious issues uh, we can hope for um, the contributions that local leadership and community base has made to the adaptation um, um, uh, dialogues um, to bring that to the loss and damage uh, issue I'll stop again there, but I'm looking forward to any contributions from others. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Jamie. Yeah, those those interlinkages and understanding the relationships amongst them, it's super, super important. Um, yes, that's duly noted. And thank you so much for making those useful contributions. Um, yeah, so from my end, um, that's all we have for the session today. And um, it was really, really a pleasure having um, you all join. And thank you so much for the contribution. Thank you so much, James. Thank you, Jagnata. Thank you for everyone that listened and made um, um, this session kind of interactive. Um, we look forward to having you all um, next year as well. Thank you so much and have a, have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.